É um prazer apresentar-vos o Julián Massani. Tem trabalhado no desenvolvimento da área do Arquivo da Web nos últimos 10 anos. Começou por coordenar o projeto do Arquivo da Web na Bibliothèque Nacional de France, entre 2000 e 2004. Participou ativamente na criação do Consórcio Internacional de Preservação da Internet, o qual coordenou durante os seus primeiros dois anos. O Julián pode ser considerado o pai do Web Archive na Europa, editou o primeiro, o primeiro livro no mundo acerca deste tema e atualmente lidera o Internet Memory Research. Julián, merci d'être ici aujourd'hui avec nous. The floor is yours. Obrigado. Oh, you can you hear me? Sorry, I'll have to speak English because my Portuguese is non-existent. Um, as I have been called the pie do web archiving in Europe, I would like to tell you a little bit about, uh, before I start, I would like to, to tell you a few words about my children. <laughs> so Daniel, please stop listening for two minutes. Um, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, there's a good reason for that. First, well, there are several good reasons. I like to come here. Fantastic city, of course. But um, I would like to say that it's this, this initiative, Archivo.pt, is special. You have basically three models. Let's talk institution before we dive into the presentation a little bit. You have three models of archive so far. And when we talk about an archive, we are talking about something that's supposed to last long. So it's important how it's structured, how, what the fabric of this institution is, its reg regulation, financing, long-term sustainability. These are important questions. There are three models currently. One model is a private foundation called Internet Archive. Uh, basically, it has some home funding and it can do what it wants. Uh, it's been doing an amazing job since 96 to archive the web. Uh, we tried with the Internet Memory Foundation to do a little bit something similar in Europe. We didn't succeed so much. But you have this private foundation model, right? In terms of long-term sustainability, you can have questions. In terms of agility, fantastic. Then you get traditional heritage institution, National Library, National Archive. I'm a librarian. I, I worked in one of them, National Ar Library of France. And they are the main player currently in the web archiving field. Uh, in terms of long-term sustainability, we can trust them. National Library of France have been, has been there. I mean, the legal deposit started in 16th century, 500 years, more than 500 years ago. You know, it's working, it's solid, it's robust. Uh, in terms of agility, less so, I would say. Besides, you are talking about a new media, and therefore, lots of habits and way of thinking and way of doing needs to be, you know, rebooted and changed and so on and so forth. So difficult task, right? They have been adapted to new media periodicals were new in the 19th century. They adapted to that and so on and so forth. But still, uh, you have this issue of agility. And then you have a third model, which is a unique one so far, where internet guys from uh, a foundation then public, basically took charge of web archiving. And this is archivo.pt. This is the only example I know of at least. And I think it's important because it takes uh, the best of both worlds. It, takes, it has the agility and the internet DNA basically built in. Therefore, they, they fully understand the media. Technically speaking, they can go very fast. But still, it has the support and the robustness of a public institution now. And this model, I think, which is the third model, is the most successful model. That's what the father of web archiving in Europe can tell you. It's the most successful because when you see your children like 15 years, 30, you love all, all your children, of course the same, right? But you can see that some made their archive open, made it searchable. In other words, put the archive, which is very good in terms of content and capture, for sure, but there are others who are quite good there. But it's the only one which is fully accessible, fully searchable, 
and that's fantastic. So before I start, I want to say, because it's the anniversary, the 10th anniversary, I want to say, bon anniversaire et longue vie archivo.pt. And I think we can, you know, that's worth it. We have to say that. Now you can listen, David, Daniel. <clears throat> so we have been celebrating 20 years, 10 years of web archiving. And basically, we are in a situation where we have a bit of hindsight on the media, on its evolution. Uh, and I would like to discuss, so we've seen it evolving. Uh, lots of things that were assu uh, assumption we had 10 years ago are questioned now. But it's a fantastic journey, right? It's fantastic because uh, we, of course, view this media and this uh, endeavor from the point of view of long-term thinking, of long-term vision. We want to make sure this is accessible, you know, several centuries down, down the road. We think, like, what has been the experience of archaeology related to understanding old artifacts? We think about how good has been the previous a cultural artifact to be preserved, and we think like that. We're, we're this kind of people, and obviously there's uh, this special view on the technology is, 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 is unique. Where, well, the others are into it. They want to build successful startups just nearby. They want to, you know, invent new technology, see adoption, and so forth. So they are really in the, in the run, and we are basically looking at things from a, a, a longer-term perspective. And now we have 10, 20 years uh, uh, of uh, experience that we can think about a, a little bit. We made the head, head front, uh, front page of uh, Le Monde, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, we have been celebrating the 20 years of the Internet Archive uh, last year. Now we're celebrating the ten, 10 years of this archive here. And I see that there's been news on the radio and media. This is fantastic. We, we wouldn't have thought about that 10 years ago when we, or 20 years ago when we started, and we are a few uh, crazy people thinking, well, we should preserve that. And people say, but why would you do that? Or you can't, it's too big, or things like that. Anyway, I want to, um, I don't know, uh, uh, basically, I want to uh, talk about three things today with you. I want to discuss a few things about the fundamentals of what we're doing. Uh, lo some, lots of has been said already, but I want to just uh, take, take you the uh, essence of the special view we have on the problem as long-term thinker, long-term archivist, long-term preser preservationist. I also want to discuss with you today how platforms, one of the big change which has occurred the last 10 years is the rise, of, the rise of platforms, platforms of content being like Facebook, Twitter, and things like that, and how they impact what we are doing, how they are changing the landscape. Uh, so that's on the side of you know, how do we adapt and how it's changing uh, from, from the years, as the years go on. And I want to also uh, present to you a few things uh, about the function uh, of this archive, how they represent a unique uh, source, corpus uh, for research and for analysis in general. And I want to take that uh, 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 special view on the fact that there are huge repository of material out there, right? Most of them are privately held, opaque, non-accessible, okay? Google has kept its indices of the web since the beginning, because it's not a big thing to, for them to archive. But that's Google. We don't have access to that, right? So they kept a unique source of information uh, indexes of page, how they relate together, but we don't have access to that, right? Facebook holds way too much of your own personal content, right? Way too much. And it's opaque. I remember a conference, the first paper uh, from a researcher of Facebook, uh, it was a dub, 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 World Wide Web conference five years ago, or six years, I'm not sure, sorry. But I remember this very interesting discussion because this guy was presenting on what he can derive from the graph inside Facebook, and, and this, the other researchers were asking, please, how can we check what you are saying? Can we access the corpus? And can we check? And so, so and he would say, oh, sorry, this is private data. We can't, uh, this is ownership of Facebook. We can't give you access, right? So we have a problem. Even research, per se, you know, couldn't access the corpus we're talking about in this type of research. 
So these are silos of information. They are opaque. Web archives, on the other hand, are there for the access of everyone, every researcher, every user, and that's absolutely important, very, very important. Basically, they are the only place where you can find all these traces of this fantastic digital life we are exposing through the web for the future. So that's why they are so important. And the fact that we have some who have been taking that challenge early and being able to execute and deliver very effectively is extremely important also for the future of research. So I would like to say a few words about a few examples of what we can do with this research and with the types of research we're talking about here. Uh, well, I'll skip that because I, I already see I have uh, not so much time. When we create archive, we crawl the web. We take pages, we extract links, and then we follow this link and we archive the page we find and we keep on and keep on and keep on. Like search engine, this is the basic way we do things. I want to draw the attention on the fundamentals of what we are doing here. We are taking samples and the way we take them is, is determined, is, is shaped by several things which we need to be aware of. This is uh, when we archive books, well, we keep books, we keep books basically. Maybe we keep information about author and other metadata, but we keep books. When we archive the web, we have explicitly meet into what we can grab, what we can capture, what we can explore. And some of these limits are set by the owner of the sites themselves. But in any case, when we take a, a, a sample a capture of the website, it, there are pieces that might be missing uh, because we have not been allowed to capture them. There are pieces which might have been captured later because the, there's a protocol called robot.txt, which basically is the way the website tells you what you have to do or what you can do with them and sometimes they tell you to slow down, therefore you will take more time to archive the website. Sometimes they tell you don't go there, and you will have not to go there, right? So we have to be aware of that. There are also other limits. We, when, we, when we request files from a server, we are being polite. That is, we send one or two requests per two, three, five seconds. One request per three seconds, basically, something like that. Imagine a website which is one million, objects, HTML image and so on and so forth. That means you have to dilute the capture of this one million throughout two weeks, three weeks. And when you started with the home page, it was Monday. And when we finish with the rest of the site, it's Saturday and there's a link to the home page. But it's the home page of Saturday, not the one you have, right? So you have to think about that. We, there's not much we can do about it. We try to be as fast as possible, but on the other hand, we, we, don't, we can't send too many requests to server, and they get upset by that, right? And, oh, sorry. There's also technical limits, basically techniques employed to expose content on the web, you know, JavaScript, asynchronous uh, downloading of content with Ajax and other things, you know, makes our life difficult to kind of follow the links and capture the content and also render it. So, we have to be aware, we are in a special case. Uh, when TV was started to be archived, there was a special case, you need to archive it at a certain time. You know, you know, there was a temporal dimension which was strongly coming in the game of archiving. With the web, with, we have other you know, specificities as regard to how it's uh, preserved. I want also to draw your attention on the cardinality of the preserved object. I know I'm the only one to talk about that, but I keep on talking about that. This is really important. Um, cardinality, it is how many instances of one piece we are to preserve we have. For museum, we have one. There's one painting of Mona Lisa. There's one. And the Italian would like to have it back, right? Uh, although it was made when uh, the Ovensi was in France, so it's okay to have it. <laughs> uh, there's one, okay? So when you have to preserve, you have to preserve this one, right? For books, uh, it's been different since the, the beginning of the uh, uh, printing in the 15th century. On average, I've made this small calculation here. You had 20, 20 million books circulated, about 30,000 editions, which mean on average you had 650 instances, books per edition. <laughs> and that makes our life very much easier than when you only have one because 
to have the 650 dis destroyed throughout time, you know, you have many chances to get them back in the library, for instance, later. They might be hidden in some obscure library there, and so on and so forth. So this is a good thing that helped us a lot preserve books in the past, right? It gives you time, it gives you redundancy. That is, these particular books can be in several libraries, we can find it later, and so on and so forth. So the preservation standpoint is important. What about the web? Well, eh, there it comes very specific again, right? Virtually, you have as many instantiation of the, comp of the content you, you want. You can look at one website as much as you want. It will be served with the same content as much as you want. But you have a very high dependency on the web server. In other words, during the night, without you can doing anything about it, they can change the content or they can take the server down and then you have absolutely nothing. So you go from infinite rendering or access to zero. <laughs> and from this point of view, this is, this is really very special. We have to, to do, we have to deal with a web information system which is controlled by the producer, which is continuous publishing. And all that is absolutely anti-long-term preservation. Web information system, complex things, files that place together and render together makes it hard to preserve for the future because we won't have the same system, the same rendering ways and so on and so forth. Control by the producer mean they can disappear, they can stop paying the domain, the server, and then the content disappears. So actually, you have the feeling it's there, it's easy, it's okay. No, it's not okay at all. At any time, and we don't control when, it can disappear, and therefore, we have to put it under the control of another organization, which is long-term oriented versus the producer who are, you know, they have their, their they have to, to deal with uh, what they, the, the publishing for them is different, right? For instance, the homepage of a newspaper has to be different every day, of course. <laughs> Maybe every minute, right? And that's by design. You can't change anything to that, right? And uh, most publishers don't think about long term. They have to do their business. They have to do what they have to do with the, when they put a website online. And they are not specifically motivated, most of them, I would say, by long term vision, or they can't or they don't have the sustainability, the sustainability for that. So basically, when we preserve the web, we are actively going against the nature of the web, right? We have to think about that. Um, that's why I think what we are after is really building an internet memory. So I, I use this term internet memory versus a web archive. Uh, internet memory meaning that first we are aware that we are automatically sampling a virtually infinite information space, right? The web can generate virtually as many pages as you want, basically. So we always have to make decisions. And as I said, the robots, the tool we use, uh, the, the limits that the technology puts in, first makes uh, it uh, clear that not everything will be archived at all. So there's lots of little decisions which are made regarding the structuring, the shaping of the archive, and we have to be aware we are sampling. And if you think about it, and there were images missing in, in one instant that uh, the Daniel showed, but more, more generally, we, when do we take, what is the frequency of capture of website, you know, what depth we have, what coverage, you know, all these things makes it, you have to think about a sampling to, to reconstitute and derive things from what you have in the archive. And that's okay, we've done that with archeology. span Archaeology, uh, if you see what we, what we can tell now with archaeology about a few remains down an earth, <laughs> an earth <laughs> from uh, five meters of uh, soil, right? We can derive a lot because we know, you know, there's these grains, you know, if it's there because of the, the way it decays, I can derive that and I can imagine what it was. So we have lots of methods to derive something from a sample, right? So that's okay. We just need to be really aware of that. Uh, the important thing is it brings a unique uh, source of temporal series, temporal information, meaning how things are dynamic, how they evolve, because we keep on taking snapshots of something which is so dynamic, right? Edited by millions or 
billions of people now. It's a contribution. Lots of people make contribution. They make a small comment on a news article. They make a small comment on a product. And, and there you go. You have something. You have a human who have, who, have a, who have put a trace here that's so new, so amazing, right? Um, and we see how this, we can see through this corpus, how this evolved through time, which is absolutely fantastic. And that makes a huge difference from search engine, by the way. Uh, the last point, which is also why I call it internet memory, I think it has to be part of the internet. Maybe that's something obvious now. But that means it, could, it can't just be something you have to go in a special building to get access to or something. I think it's so important that it's part of the internet. When you see a website, you could see the versions. You know, There was some discussion in the protocol early on whether we should keep uh, that managed by the protocol itself, the internet protocol, underlying protocol. And then they decided they wouldn't do that because it's a bit complicated and then it's never been made. And you know, there's lots of things we can think of, but basically the idea is when I'm, wherever I'm, when I'm looking at something, I should be, I would like to be able to look at what it was before, how it's evolved and things like that. And I should do that from the internet, I believe. So that's a few bits of fundamentals um, uh, that we need to keep in mind. What, what we're building is, a, is, a, is an archive a very special archive, it has its own property. We need to understand how it's going to, what, what it can do, what it can't, how it's going to be used. But the main thing is it has an amazing value. Think about the excitement of, you know, people when they uh, found, the historian when they found the Doomsday Book, right? The Doomsday Book was a registry of family, uh, how many people were they married, how many children, right? When Guillaume uh, Le Conquérant took uh, <laughs> Brittany, he said, okay, what do I got? <laughs> and then uh, he, in every village, they send people to how many people, ta ta da 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 Doomsday Book is, is, a, is a fantastic source of information uh, for this time, uh, 11th century, I think, something like that, which basically it gives you a view. It's not the king married with these women and they had these children, uh, you know, the usual uh, chronicles that we had from this time. We have something which talks about oh, all the rest of the humans, right? <laughs> say something about it at least, right? And the archives of police and other archives have been used by historians in an amazing manner uh, from the 19th century and other. Uh, they have been sources of, uh, they have changed history basically. We've done quantitative history, we've done so many different things with that, right? Think about what the web archive will enable, enable in the future. They will be the key corpus for future research on so many domains, so many things. So that's why they are important. Um, I would like to discuss now a little bit about uh, the right of the palace for form and how they change things. We, we, we discussed the fact that, um, uh, you know, we have been doing that for a decade or two now, right? And we have seen lots of changes. I won't talk about the disappearance of uh, Flash Player because actually that's a good thing. Um, uh, but I will talk about um, the structuring of things in front of us, how the internet structure is so different now. And maybe we don't all realize that, but it has changed so much things. And, as, and I would like to discuss with you a little bit about how this impacts uh, preservation. I think the web before looked a bit like that. It was fragmented, colorful, wonderful. It was, you know, fantastic place. Now it looks a little bit like that, right? Or if you want, it's like you're in Italy or in France or in Portugal, you go to the market, you get weather is nice and you have lots of variety and now you're there, right? That's my personal take. Um, but we have these silos of content. These silos of content mean uh, people maybe that didn't really completely understood that, but the architecture of the internet is fundamentally, absolutely, uh, technically distributed. In other words, you can pop up on the internet without asking anybody. You register your website, you expose ports and content, and that's it, you're there, right? Uh, that's how it's been thought through and built on from the bottom layer protocol to the application layer, right? And now on the web, the web was like that. The web was like that. You, you can pop up and uh, appear on the web and you are in control. You can do what you want in your information space, which is your domain name. That's what you control and anything that happens within that is yours, you can do what you want. Now we have, um, uh, how should I say, unfortunately, and maybe without taking much attention to that, 
uh, trade uh, simplicity uh, against uh, control, right? So basically we are using now, we are talking about things, we are using Twitter, we have to, you, you are using Facebook, I'm not. Uh, well, maybe you're not either. You are publishing uh, videos and of course there are some personal stuff there, so fair, right? But there's also lots of the conversation, of the public conversation, which now is appearing there, right? You have politicians who think it's a good idea to make their discourse on Facebook, right? And maybe it is from their point of view because that's where people are. It's easier than the real internet, you know, the raw, the basic, the, uh, the, the real internet rate, uh, basically. And, and now they use that for communication. They are inside a silo. They are within Zuckerberg's, Zuckerberg's space. He controls what's happening there. You don't. And when you put things there, you lose control. And from our point of view, this means that more and more of the important public stuff is happening in this silo. And uh, they, they are now structured in front of us. We don't have to deal with millions of different websites that we have to find and archive and so on and so forth. We have to deal with the two or three big guys, or five, right? And all the content is inside, right? Um, and that's a problem because basically that means, uh, of course, there's still the internet, thanks God, and I think it's going to remain, by the way, the real, the external, uh, the open web, basically, and there are good reasons for that, and sometimes even Facebook realized how important it is. Maybe for the anecdote, if I have time, I uh, don't have much time, but. Well, Zuckerberg was very happy he could provide access to Facebook through web. Once he realized that otherwise he, he would have to do it through Google's Android platform. And at some point in some countries, he absolutely cut other access than web to maybe be sure that he could always get access to his user through the web, the open web, and not through the application that was could potentially vetoed by, uh, by Google, his competitor. I, I'll end up with that. So there's lots of interest in having an open web behind. But so what do we do with these archives? There's, uh, of course, you, you have maybe heard of that. There was a donation of the Twitter archive to the Library of Congress. So of course, the Portuguese uh, politician are now the Library of Congress. Maybe the Library of Portugal would have liked to have them, but you know, Twitter is not going to talk to everybody, so you have to live with that, right? So that's, that's the point, right? Uh, who decides? They decide what will be preserved, who will preserve that, and there's three or four or five of this company. Is that okay? Not sure. What are the legal limits that we have? We could technically, they could, sorry, technically archive things, but the regulation doesn't force them at all in this regard. So we are late with the regulation again. We are not catching up with that to some extent. I don't know the details for the Portuguese re regulation, but to some extent we are now facing, it's not that they don't, uh, you know, it's not that they don't uh, like us or want us, it's just they don't see us. They don't see, uh, they are busy with uh, the companies, that's, that's the thing. And technical limits, we have technical limits when we are talking with big, you know, big repository, a big silo like that to try to capture the content from them. First we need more machines, oh, that's okay, and then we have the API access, but the API access, that is we access directly the content through machine programming, uh, what about the, the preservation? For instance, here's an archive we, make, uh, we made for uh, uh, the Parliament of the UK. We created this uh, fake YouTube uh, page because uh, we couldn't really, we, we got the videos and we got the stories here from the API, but we had to present it some way. So do we present it like that or can we present it with the YouTube logo and everything? So that's a bit uh, fuzzy, you know? Uh, so this is taken from the API and the videos as well. Another example is with Twitters. Again, this is not exactly Twitters, as you can see. It looks a little bit like that. It's putting into context the tweets that we get from, from the archive. So this, the race of this platform to, to wrap it up is, is, is becoming extremely important. At the beginning, we thought, okay, well, that's private conversation. It's okay not to have it. We don't want it anyway. And then it became, you know, government and everybody, public people, everybody is actually using this platform because it's so easy and now we have a problem because, you know, the most interesting active stuff may be occurring within this platform. So how do we do with that? And that really changes the, the picture because we, we have to deal with five, six big guys instead of millions of websites and we have to 
think about our method again and, and how we adapt to that. I want to finish the, the few minutes I have to, to discuss about the way the web archives is, an, is a corpus for analysis, for research and, and in general. I want to take you through examples, maybe that is, that's okay, and then we have 10, ten minutes of questions if you want. So, um, first is we are, back, we are part of a larger trend in science, which is uh, micro-analysis, -anal some call it big data, some call it uh, distant reading, you, you can call it various ways. The idea basically behind that is the focus is not, lo not so much longer on a single document or a single page or a single piece of data, right? The idea is what we, you can do is you can have large scale analysis which show you strengths, correlation, how things differ and so on and so forth. So that requires extraction of data, indexing, and uh, ana statistical analysis, simple things like distribution, correlation, and things like that. Which means you have a, a, value of, uh, a value chain of the research now, which is for us uh, composed of like this, right? We are talking still about sourcing, capturing the data, crawling, indexing this data. So this is really generic. We do the same techniques and methods for every, things we, uh, every type of uh, corpus we create because these are related to the web, not to the corpus we create per se, right? And then we have this processing which is you know, we, we mine this content, we apply analytics, we, we apply, we prepare data, we prepare, we extract series of information in a particular way, and we prepare the corpus so that it can be used for, for analytics. And then we apply algorithm, uh, which helps us, you know, view things at a, at a higher scale. And then you get research per se, which starts also with visualization and addressing specific research issue. I will come to some example here. Uh, this is, um, to, to put that into context. This is eDiaspora. This is a, a, a fantastic project uh, which has been done by social scientists. I think this is the first I've seen where you had a real research question, not a made up question by computer scientists like, you know, I, I would imagine what would be a research question. No, you had questions from political scientists, anthropologists, you know, people studying media. Real question. They had questions like, how is the dias around diaspora? That's the theme, all right? And you had questions like, what is the main influence from the Lebanese in diaspora regarding institution? Who are they pointing to? What is, what, what is their structural, uh, what they, what is their, how they see their environment? Like question like that, very deep question. Actually, you can see this question on ediaspora.fr if you're interested. And they analyze corpuses and they derived responses to this question from the analysis of this corpus. So, and they, 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 had, they got some answers to these questions. And this was not a, a, a made-up exercise uh, that you would do in a computer science course to pretend that you have really answered questions. These were real, real questions, and they got some uh, response to that. And the way you do that is you organize, for instance, they were lo looking a lot on the topology of connection between people and sites and things like that. And this topology helped them understand uh, some relations that they were discovering through that. Uh, you always can see throughout our uh, archive, you can see evolution of things. This is evolution of an editing tool, but it can be applied to other things like evolution of blog, spread of information, who started talking about something, how has it been uh, uh, diffusing throughout the public sphere, and things like that. And these questions can be answered because you are able to extract a certain piece of information you are interested in, show how big it is, show how it's spread out through time. And this is typically the kind of analysis you can do uh, with, with web archive. Um, I would like also to draw your attention, I mean, you're, you're certainly aware that uh, we, we have these uh, new possibilities now with deep learning to analyze images, for instance, or pieces of content, which usually didn't make sense uh, by themselves. You couldn't really automate the analysis with these. Now you can, you have this, uh, a neural networks which basically treat the low level feature, things that look a little bit like these pieces of things, then high level feature, like how they compose together, and very high level features like, you know, what they represent semantically. And I'm summarizing that very quickly, you have 30, 50, uh, 60 layers of networks, and they basically they, they work like the brain, that works. And it reminds me when I was a student in cognitive science and doing neurobiology because we were doing these things, and saying these things and 20 years after now uh, that's applied at large scale and it's fantastic. That's an example we've done uh, at Internet Memory Research. 
our tool is able, we have trained this tool and it's able to understand this is a case. See it differently, different colors, still, this is a case. Still, see it open, this is a case. See it, uh, a detail of the image, that's a case, a luggage. So this has been automatically detected as being part of the luggage as an object from a neural network, right? And that's the kind of things we do and the reason why it's important to a web archive to do that because we can train this model. We can train this corpus with millions, tens of millions of images, you know, sources of data. The data is, is key, absolutely key to get good trainings in this domain. So these are examples of what can be done with web archive. I'm not taking an example from Facebook on purpose. Facebook does amazing thing with that, but we can do things with web archive as well like that. So this is an object detector that will enable uh, analysis of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, objects in the future using web archive. It also can help us with building the archive. We can, uh, we have developed this, uh, which is a, a way to analyze crawl while we do it. Basically in web archive, we usually use uh, file, MIME types, uh, checksums, and they don't tell you the real truth most of time. For instance, if you recrawl the same page again and again, uh, but it's slightly different, then the exact sum, uh, the checksum will be different. And therefore you think you're, you're discovering something new, whereas you're not. Based on similar detection, we detect similarity within page, not exact uh, uh, match, but uh, similarity. We are able to see how our crawls are doing. Are they spending too much time in in traps, are they being efficient, and things like that. Won't go too much in the details. Uh, I want to fin finish with this uh, other example we've developed, which is genre analysis. Um, basically, currently, if you're a national archive or a large archive, you have to crawl the entire web, and there's, we're talking about uh, tens of millions of websites. So you can't take time to decide, okay, this one, I want it more often because it's more important. You, you can't do that. So basically, you do what we call bulk archiving, that is, you archive everything and then, you know, you spend your energy and capacity sometime in archiving content you may not want to archive so often. So we thought, well, could we at least detect, using machine learning we use to detect the publication genre. Genre meaning, is it a news site? Is it an e-commerce site? Is it a blog site? Is it porn? Is it a company website? Because if it's, for instance, an e-commerce site, I might want to archive an e-commerce site, by the way, because it gives me an idea of product price at a certain point in time. Very important for economic analysis, for instance. So very good. But when you archive a, an e-commerce site, the point is to ar archive the old inventory. And you can do that every six months because it doesn't change so often. So with the e-commerce site, you can say, okay, I will do the e-commerce site in depth, but every six months. Whereas news site, you might want to archive them very differently. You, you might want to archive them every day, potentially, every hour, to see how things are presented to the public, but not deep. So this is a different way of archiving which is appropriate for both, right? So the idea behind that is if we are able to analyze genre automatically, we can change the revisit frequency, we can change the crawling budget, the depth at which we train. We can also blacklist spam or other type of content if we don't want them. Uh, so I, I'm running out of time, but I want just to give you an example, this is automatically detected as being e-commerce site. As you can see, they're relatively different. And we only use structural features. That is, it's not language dependent, okay? So it works on any language. It's been applied to uh, uh, German and, and French here, for instance, but it's not been trained on German and French specifically, okay? Block site, these block sites are very different. You can, you can agree with me, you know? And we can detect they are the same genre. With that, of course, you are able, I think, to organize better your crawling policy. What I'm saying here is basically, these analytics also are useful and will be useful for the archiving itself process, the archiving process to build better archive, to spend maybe more time on some type of content than on others, to adapt the frequency on the, you know, how dynamic content is and so on and so forth. So it's also useful for us, right, to use this analytics as well. But, uh, but of course, it's going to be something we want to expose to researchers, and they are going to do amazing researches uh, with that. Uh, we, ne we need to be aware of that. Maybe you're not impressed by my detector of luggages, right? But 
you know, from that, you can imagine, start to imagine how, what the future research would look like, how, what we can derive from this corpus, right? So it's extremely important. We are building this corpus as large, as, as systematically as possible, as is the case here. And that's why I want to, again, provide my support to this uh, fantastic job that's being done here. Obligado, maybe it's not well written, sorry for that. <laughs> Thanks for your attention.